Hi, folks. Welcome to a very special episode of Be Healthistic. Recently, my dad and I did a Facebook Live event to answer the questions that our audience had about stress and health. We're sharing that here so that you can get all the benefits of this valuable information. Let us know what you think about this Q&A by sending us an email at podcasts at healthydirections.com. If you like it, we'll make sure we do more of these and invite you to ask your questions. Welcome, everyone. This is Facebook Live, something my father and I have not done in probably over a year and a half now. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, Dad. Hey, it's good to be here, Drew. Long time. <laughs> Long time. So this is great. Well, today we're going to be talking all about stress and how stress impacts the heart, stress impacts our mood, stress impacts our digestion. And everyone can agree watching this. Every single one of us are under tremendous amounts of stress these days uh, during COVID times. We were already under a lot of stress before COVID and now add this layer on top. And certainly everyone's having troubles with dealing with stress in their life, the uncertainty of what's happening, the virus itself, the economic destruction that is occurring from this. So there's so many different layers of stress that are, we're all experiencing right now. And we're going to be talking all about that today. Now, Dad, where do you want to start with this? Do you want to jump in with stress and the heart and what you've seen over the years and what people can do to help sure, remedy that? You know yeah, I mean, uh, stress in the heart is easy for me because when I became a cardiologist, uh, I, I studied to be a psychotherapist because I realized that uh, a lot of the sudden death I was seeing and a lot of the heart attacks were related to emotional stress. And when I received my cardiovascular boards back in 1977 and my internal medicine boards in 75, the Vietnam War had just waned down. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, are, there were so many people in the state of Connecticut you know, the Groton Subbase, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, Colt Firearms. So many people lost their jobs. And I was seeing, Drew, it was amazing. I was a young cardiologist in my mid-30s, and I'm seeing people my age with heart attacks and sudden death coming in. And I was doing coronary angiograms on these people. And I realized the loss of a job in the mail or the sudden unexpected loss of a job when the defense industry was waning down uh, was devastating to men. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I was seeing all these cases. Uh, I remember one case uh, in a guy who um, had to fire somebody at his place of employment. And he was so angry when the administrator told him to fire one of his employees, he developed an acute aortic dissection. Wow. Uh, and uh, he he lived through it. But I reported him in the, uh, one of the cardiovascular journals because his anger was so toxic that he literally burst his aorta open. And that's, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's really serious. I remember another guy who, he was in his 40s, and he routinely brought his car to a gas station to get an oil change. And he got everything changed. They got a new oil filter, but they forgot to put the oil in. And he drove away, and about three minutes later, his car <laughs> seized up. He was so angry because he, he pulled his car with a rope to get it out, out of the intersection. Oh my goodness. And he had a massive infarction, a, a heart attack. And, uh, and again, all related to anger. So anger is the Achilles heel of the cardiovascular system. There's no doubt about it. And I tell people, I say all, you know, for years as a, as a heart specialist, you know, it's not worth dying for. Nothing is worth dying for. So if you have anger or sadness or rage is the worst emotion because rage <clears throat> fights uncontrollability. And when you're uncontrollable, you know, people can do th bad things under rage. They can kill other people. They can kill themselves. I mean, I mean, I've seen that happen. So, um, you know, in this day and day and age of COVID, we got to be really cautious how to handle our anger, our rage, our sadness and our emotions, you know, related to this. Well, to, to the epidemic and, and the usual stresses that we all have in everyday life. And, and what about fear? Because a lot of people are living under this massive umbrella of fear, whether it's fear of the virus itself getting sick or transmitting it to others, and also the fear of losing a job, uh, fear of losing your home. I, I read in the USA Today this morning that 40 million Americans are going to be losing their homes from this pandemic. 40 million Americans will be losing their homes. That is unprecedented, the level of stress that people are going to be under. And underlying a lot of that is fear, right? Fear of the unknown, fear of not having enough food, fear of not uh, having something else in your life, 
even water, for example, or something like that. So it's, um, it's, it's scary times for people out there. Well, another word for fear is vigilance. And vigilance is like waiting for the other shoe to drop. In other words, you're living in fear, you're living in vigilance, you're living in uncertainty, all those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And that is devastating to the cardiovascular system because what happens is the stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol get released and people can, uh, if they have low potassiums, for example, there's more sudden death that occurs during episodes of longstanding fear because of you know potassium and calcium derangements in the serum. So it's very important for people to um, realize that fear can be devastating. Uh, make sure you know we tell our people to take in lots of fresh fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of potassium, you know, mm -hmm. drink potassium drinks and stuff like that, because uh, these minerals can get uh, wasted over time and it makes the heart more vulnerable to going out of uh, uh, rhythm and uh, again, I saw so many cases of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and, and even atrial fibrillation uh, in situations of you know uncertainty and fear. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna we're gonna dive into some of those later on in the show today. And I wanted to talk to our listeners right now. Uh, we're here for your questions. So if you have any questions, please post them. Uh, we're gonna jump in right now to a couple of our questions. This first one is from Donna Baker. If your adrenals aren't functioning properly and thyroid as well, and your back is really out of alignment, can these things cause palpitations and dizziness? Also, can all the stress bring on problems with adrenals and cause fear, anxiety, and panic? Yeah, well, I would answer that all of the above. Yeah, I, mean, right. I mean, that's a bad combination. Uh, if, you're, if your adrenals and your cortisol get depleted, and your I mean, thyroid isn't working as well. And the thyroid isn't working. Uh, a low thyroid with a with a exhausted adrenal, uh, you're in double handcuffs, so to speak. I mean, Hans Selye wrote about this for years. You know, uh, vital exhaustion. And um, and actually, when I studied with Al Lowen, uh, I, I actually came up with the term vital exhaustion. And that's a bad situation. So you know, it's important for people to. You know, try to keep their adrenals up. You know, in other words, uh, thyroid's another one. I mean, there's an epidemic of low thyroid in this country. A lot of it is due to cellular phone, Drew, where people are holding a cordless phone or a cellular phone towards their ear, and the electromagnetics uh, uh, that's you know it's only a few inches away can penetrate the thyroid and 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 render the thyroid to to not work efficiently and, and you get a hypothyroid condition so hypothyroidism overstress uh, with adrenal overload uh, you know low thyroid hormone uh, adrenal exhaustion cortisol thrown in the mix this is a recipe for cardiac arrhythmias and uh, you know people need to be very cautious and again eat a healthy diet with lots of minerals or take in minerals and uh, at least that'll give you some, you know, assurance that, you know, your heart can withstand the stress. Because let me tell you this, if you have a heart low in potassium and you're facing stress, that's when it gets very, very dangerous. Right, right. And I'll speak to the adrenals really quick, Dad, because I feel like a lot of our listeners should really understand what the adrenals do in our body. They're these little triangular shaped glands that sit on top of your kidneys, and they're the ones that pump out cortisol and other uh, hormones as well, like norepinephrine and epinephrine. And cortisol, like what you mentioned, is the stress hormone. And uh, a lot of us right now are probably have high cortisol levels because we're under this cloud of stress all the time from COVID. And what I see in my practice is people do have high cortisol levels, but they also have low cortisol levels, and that's a problem too. So you really wanna have a balance of cortisol levels. You don't wanna have too high and you don't wanna have too low. And Ultimately, you want to help balance out those levels by reducing stress in your life, whether it is going for a walk in nature, whether it's meditating or doing some sort of a breathing technique, like you like to do that alternate nostril breathing that's really good for, you know, regulating the, the autonomic nervous system. And uh, anything that you can do to calm down your body is going to help lower those cortisol levels. And, and what I want to talk about here too, Dad, is there's there's the physical stress that we feel sometimes with physical ailments, like Donna just mentioned, low back pain, that creates stress in your body. But there's also perceived stress, perceived stress. And that is this looming threat that we experience right now during COVID, which is, which is scary for folks, right? And 
uh, that that perceived stress can be incredibly stressful for people, and it acts like real stress in the body, and that can really damage the adrenal glands and and uh, dysregulate cortisol levels as well. Yeah, well, that's what you said before. Living in fear and vigilance, you know, creates that situation. You know, you said something very, very important, Drew. You said walking out in nature, mm -hmm. and I and we should tell our listeners one of the best ways of adjusting the imbalance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system is walking barefoot outside. Because whenever you walk grounded, and you're an expert in grounding, you've published a lot of papers on grounding. <laughs> uh, you, you know, we can tell our listeners, whenever they do ground themselves, now, if you have a hypervigilant sympathetic nervous system, it tends to be balanced by some parasympathetic uh, discharge. And that is very important as well. So um, I think grounding in this day and age of COVID is one of the healthier things we can do to, you know, lower the cortisol and adrenaline that can, you know, have adverse effects on us. And, and also too, you're familiar with this, those studies out of Japan with forest bathing. So, so going out into the woods, there's actually studies to show that your cortisol level can go down and it can actually help regulate stress. And, uh, if you can go out barefoot walking on a trail in the woods, that's, that's the best thing you can ultimately do for yourself. <laughs> right. Right. Or walking in the ocean or with, you know, I, I think the best, the best grounding is where the ocean meets the sand in that little surf area, you know, and, and I'll tell you, uh, when I'm in Florida, I take my fly rod and I just walk that beach for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards. And, and sometimes I go out at six o'clock in the morning when nobody's out there and it's just, it's nirvana for me. I got to tell you, and very, very healing as well. Couldn't agree more with that, dad. <laughs> well, let's take another question here from our audience. Can you discuss how, or if stress can cause GERD symptoms to flare up? Also, is there anything natural that can help with what feels like heart flutters? All right, Dad, I'll take the first segment of this question here. She's asking about um, how stress can cause GERD symptoms. So let's dig into this, Dad. And we've talked about this on, on podcasts before, but when you're living in a stress environment, we're, we're leaning more towards a, a sympathetic drive, a sympathetic state. And that's when the cortisol kicks in. That's when the epinephrine, the norepinephrine kicks in. And during a sympathetic state, you, this is when your body is very alert, right? You're trying to get out of a situation that is dangerous, or let's say with prehistoric man, you're trying to run away from the proverbial tiger or something like that. So what's happening there is that your, your body is using all its resources to survive. And that's really what it's designed to do is to keep you alive. Now, if you're living under that environment all the time, like some of us are with COVID, with social media, with um, notifications on your phone that come through every five minutes, with text messages, with emails, like the, the mainstream media just, you know, putting out fearful stuff around COVID and everything. That is all stress that is chronic and people feel that all the time. And that's putting us more into the sympathetic state. Now, in order to have really good digestion, you need to have uh, more of a parasympathetic state, which is more of the rest and digest. And that's so that your enzyme systems in your in your body, your digestive system can kick in and you can actually digest food more efficiently. But if you're in flight or flight mode, sympathetic driven mode, you're not going to be digesting food all that well. So what happens is people can develop GERD, which is really heartburn, chronic heartburn. And uh, this is for many reasons. One, which I want to talk about at this moment is I know a lot of people, including myself, this happens where I'm eating lunch and I'm just shoveling food in my mouth and I'm reading something on the internet about COVID or something happening in the world right now that's terrible. And that ultimately is not helping with my digestion because ultimately I'm not, I'm not chewing my food for one. And two, I am reading something that is very negative or scary and that's influencing my uh, nervous system. So what I recommend people do is first off to chew your food very thoroughly. So that means chew it as much as you can. Like it should be liquid in your mouth before you swallow it. And number two, when you're, uh, eating food, I love to do what you do, do dad, is really to, to say a little prayer beforehand, to give thanks for the food, for the farmers for bringing that food to you. And I think that puts people in a really good state to be present for their meal so that they're not rushed and they're not shoveling food in their mouth and they're not waiting to do the next thing that they have to do, the next errand they have to run. And when you really focus on your food, you're present there, you're chewing your food, that's going to allow for more optimal digestion from the beginning, and it will hopefully lead to less symptoms associated with heartburn. Yeah, well said, Drew. And I would add uh, one more remedy. 
I mean, I think, especially in this day and age, uh, digestive enzymes are so important. I mean, I remember the late Marcus Lowe. He was a naturopath just like yourself, and uh, I was very good friends for him but for years. And about 20 years ago, we were eating dinner together, and he was popping digestive enzymes immediately. And I said, what's that? And he told me, he says, amylase lipase, and, you know, we can mm -hmm. get the rundown. And it, it, it had such an impact on me that ever since then, um, because I trusted him, he, was, uh, he knew a lot. I mean, he was just an amazing guy that um, I've always used digestive enzymes. And I think today, in this day and age of COVID, and you said it very, very um, nicely, and, and you were <laughs> very concise you know, with, your, you know, with your thoughts, in this day and age of COVID, you know, we are stewing in our digestive juices. You know, when people are getting more GERD, they're getting more mm -hmm. ulcers, they're getting more dyspepsia and all that stuff. So chewing your food is a start. But to finish it off, I think, we, you know, we need three or four capsules of uh, digestive enzymes just to keep down, you know, or helping our digestive system. In other words, we, we're giving it some adjunctive um, supports mm -hmm. in digesting the food. And that's what we really need right now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, Dad. And also, too, what's happening these days with, with COVID and all the stress we're under is people are stress eating. So yeah. they'll tend to grab a bag of potato chips late at night or they'll eat uh, dessert two times during the day, or they'll just have more sugar because a lot of people do crave more sugar during these times of stress, and that ultimately doesn't lead to good digestion. Um, so let's let's take another question. The second from the, part oh, to go that ahead, Dan. question, I forgot what it was. It was on. Uh, oh, right. Thank you. So she was asking. This is from Nisha again. Uh, is there anything natural that can help with what feels like heart flutter? Anything natural for heart flutters? I mean. I, again, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of potassium, you know, and, uh, you know, and minerals, uh, calcium, potassium, magnesium. magnesium. I think they're so important uh, because we're going to discharge a lot of uh, minerals, you know, and it's, it's, it's important to keep our mineral status up. So for heart, for any sensation of heart flutters, uh, go to minerals are easy. It's so easy to take more minerals. Uh, and, and, and even uh, additional table salt that, um, you know, Himalayan salts, for example, that have a little bit of not only iodine in there, but, you know, different trace uh, elements as well. So I'm all in on minerals, especially during this age of COVID, because we need minerals for, that are supportive for the heart. And I'm glad you mentioned the salt piece there, Dad, because a lot of people do have a fear of, of using salt. And if you're cooking most of your meals at home and you're not eating processed foods or, or soups for that matter, or there is a really high sodium content, I always tell people it's, it's okay to sprinkle some salt on their meals because you are getting uh, minerals in that if it's a high quality salt. Um, and also kind of historically, um, sodium and other minerals have been helpful for the adrenal glands as well. So you're right, getting multiple exactly. functions there. All right, let's, let's take a, another question here from the audience. This is from Amber. Hey, Amber, how you doing? <laughs> Uh, how does fear affect weight gain in children? My daughter has way more activity this summer and is eating the same, but seems to have gained weight. She's six years old, and I'm not sure how to help her. Well, really what happens is when, and children experience this too, just as adults do, but when you have these high levels of cortisol, your metabolism gets affected, and you can actually start storing fat when cortisol levels are high. So that's a mechanism that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if there's anything else that you're aware of there, Dad. Well, the other thing, too, is carbohydrates. I, I, I just feel that, uh, again, uh, if stress is a factor in COVID and if, if, if children mirror their parents and their parents are showing fear or over-concern, hopefully not panic, but if the, if the parent does this, a child may mirror that. If the parent starts to eat more, the child may eat more. And, and especially during this time, we want to watch sugar. Not only does sugar depress the immune system, which is very dangerous during COVID, but like you said, I mean, sugar can lead to so many other unhealthy situations, particularly weight gain and insulin re resistance. And uh, we're seeing it more and more in young children, insulin yeah. resistance. So we got to be really careful during this day and age and uh, eat a lot less sugar, a lot less carbs, eat more healthy fats and, and certainly more healthy proteins as well. Yeah, and I should add too, Dad, that when you do have these sugar cravings, because ev everyone has a sugar craving at, at some point, especially now, when you do have that craving or you want to open up a bag of chips at night before, before you go to bed, 
go for a walk. Even if it is late at night, I'm telling you, if you can just distract your brain a little bit by getting movement into your body instead of that food, which will not serve you, that can be really helpful for that distraction piece. So you get, you, you don't get focused so much on the sugar, but you get focused on how your body feels good after movement. Yeah. And I would add one more than that. And uh, I remember we did a podcast with Dr. Michael Murray and I asked him this very question. You know, if you had to choose one food out of his six superfoods, he said dark chocolate. And he's <laughs> right. absolutely right. I mean, the beauty of taking just a small piece of dark chocolate mm -hmm. is that you, you will get a little sugar, but the polyphenol activity is going to overwhelm, you know, any of the negative impact of sugar. And these bioflavonoids and these flavonoids found in dark chocolate uh, uh, are really supportive for the body. I mean, they not only reduce blood pressure in a lot of people, but they have these antioxidant effects as well. So I'm all in on a little bit of dark chocolate if you do need a sugar fix. If you, if you must have a little sugar, you know, one or two pieces of dark chocolate, you know, a few times a week, I see no problem with. And chocolate has the mood enhancing benefits exactly. as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It has a feel good, <laughs> you know, aspect to it. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for posting these questions. We'd love it if you can post some more. I'm going to take another one right here from right now from our audience. This is from Peggy West. What are the best supplements to take to boost the immune system? Boy, this is something that I, uh, I'm on the radio and TV all the time on, you know, and um, let me just suggest a few. I'll tell you what I do. I mean, I take vitamin D every day. I think vitamin D right now is an unsung hero. Um, and no matter where you are, if you're in Atlanta or if you're in Minneapolis, uh, whether in the, you know, a lot of people in the northern uh, latitudes have diminished vitamin D levels. They've done this with serum levels. And if you live above Atlanta, you have low vitamin Ds. If you live below Atlanta, you have higher vitamin Ds. But now that more research has been done and even people below Atlanta are deficient in vitamin D. So I think two to 5,000 units of vitamin D, D, especially in this day and age of COVID, is a must. I would definitely do it. Vitamin D is essential. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C at least every day. I mean, I, I take one of my mineral packets uh, that contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. I love it. And I actually do it out a couple of times a day. I mean, taking quercetin, for example. I think quercetin is one of these nutrients that not only supports respiratory health, but it has a remarkable impact on oxidative stress in the body. Uh, garlic and onions uh, you can certainly take in, in foods. And the list goes on and on. And if you need something with stress, I love ashwagandha, for example. I've been taking ashwagandha for like for 20 years. It's these, one of these supplements that has a balancing effect on the on an autonomic nervous system. And remember, whenever the autonomic nervous system is overstressed, it affects the immune system. So, uh, you know, all these systems are sort of combined together. And it's important that, um, you know, reducing stress and tension by taking a few supplements um, and fortifying your immune response at the same time is, is really the key going forward. Yeah, and I would, I would echo all those, Dad. I think the vitamin D is, is, like you said, an unsung hero. And also, it's really good for mood, which mm -hmm. people need some help and support with these days. Um, and I like the ashwagandha piece as well, because you're right. When you are taking uh, an adaptogen, right? Mm -hmm. And adaptogens help adapt people to stress. That's really what they're designed to do. Ashwagandha is a perfect, perfect herb for that purpose. And it's not too stimulating either because there are a lot of adaptogens out there like licorice root, for example, or like a Panax ginseng that might be too stimulating for people. But this one, the ashwagandha, they can take even at night before bed and they can still sleep really well from taking that. No, I agree 100 percent. I mean, I like I said, I have a long experience with ashwagandha. Uh, rhodiola is another one. But again, people may get a little bit of a buzz from that as well. So but I think ashwagandha is the probably the highest adaptogen people can take right now, especially in this day and age of COVID. And I'll add two more uh, supplements, Dad, for immune support. I would add zinc and I would oh, also absolutely. add oh uh, colostrum. I'm a big colostrum uh, proponent because I do find that it really helps support the gut health. And most of our immune system is located in and around our gut. So when you're supporting you know, the gut, then your, your systemic uh, immune system is going to be improved as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I think zinc is another one of these minerals that you must have. And, and there's good data to show that zinc may uh, 
maybe similar to hydroxychloroquine. I mean, in other words, you know, some researchers believe, is it the hydroxychloroquine that made a difference or is, is it the zinc? You know, because even New York Hospital was doing a, a study on this as well, and it hasn't, I don't think it's out yet, but I think zinc is really important, especially in this day and age. And a lot of us are zinc deficient too. So it's, um, exactly. you know, make sure you're taking a multivitamin that has some zinc in it or take zinc uh, separately by itself. All right, let's take another question from our audience here. Uh, this is from Kathy Cadell. Hello, Kathy. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, over the last five months, I've been more stressed than usual and my blood pressure has increased. What can I do to alleviate this and get my blood pressure back under control? You know, the first hit I get is earthing and grounding. I mean, uh, I, I've mentioned this to celebrities. People have called me. I'm getting calls all the time. And again, it's it's the times we live in. The emotional stress of the COVID is is, is a factor. You know, living indoors and uh, being trapped. And I mean, you know, whatever it is, it affects the autonomic nervous system. And remember that grounding discharges the autonomic nervous system immediately. I mean, it's just incredible. And grounding not only has the the discharging effect where it lowers blood pressure, but it thins the blood at the same time. So uh, I ground all the time. Even when I'm on a computer, Drew, I have a grounding mat underneath my feet. Mm -hmm. So I'm grounding at home. I sleep grounded at night. You know, I have a, a rod that goes out my window with a wire attached to my, you know, grounded uh, the sheet. The best way to ground yourself. And I'm telling you, I, I just think, uh, you know, people should sleep grounded and even walk as much as they can barefoot outside. You know, like concrete, not an asphalt. Asphalt is not the ground, but sand, dirt, grass. I think, like like I mentioned before, the beach is probably the best way. But uh, the more you can earth, uh, oh my gosh, uh, it does so many important physiological um, uh, remedy. It, it creates physiological remedies for the overtaxed autonomic nervous system. Yeah, and, and I'll say this too, Dad. You, you know, like right now during COVID times, we're we're uh, socially distancing and wearing masks, which everyone should be doing. I do believe that people should do, do some social distancing from the media because I do find that the the, the media is, uh, is stressing us out. There's so much information coming at so many different angles from so many different platforms, whether it's, uh, you know, Twitter or if it's like watching the news or if it's even like Facebook and Instagram and all kinds of things. We're, we're just bombarded with all this stress. And no wonder Kathy is experiencing a little elevation in blood pressure. If I measure my blood pressure after watching the news, I'm sure that I would have a high blood pressure as well. So I do believe that people should socially distance from media occasionally because we do need a break from it. I don't think that it's really good for us uh, to be doing it so frequently and it's hard to get away from it really. And, and even at even a present hurricane in Florida, people were really fearful on the East coast. And, you know, I've, I've gotten so many phone calls because I live in Florida for half the year and people said this, this was nothing. It was a breeze. But the media, again, blows that up, you know? So, yeah, if you're watching the media, you're, you're scared. Yeah. And the, the fear level is going up. And, Cortisol's um, going up. Cortisol's Adrenaline's going up. And there goes up. that whole thing. Yeah. Um, now, I wanted to reply to Kathy with something that I would recommend doing. And that is, that's meditation. And I know, Dad, and you and I have gone on many podcasts and talked about this before. But um, I'll just share with the audience what I do on a daily basis. I wake up every morning around 6.30 or 7. And I'll meditate for around 20 minutes. And all that is for me is I sit on a meditation cushion and I close my eyes, sit up in a, a upright position and I just focus on the breath coming in and out of my nose. And I have all these thoughts come through my head around all the projects I need to get done, the work I need to do, driving my kids to school. All these things are on my mind. But what happens is I just I have those thoughts come in and I just let them go. It's kind of like the, the 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 tide or like the waves coming in, you know, on, if you're on a if you're on a beach, you know, the waves come in, they go out. It's sort of that's what you do with the thoughts coming in and out. And if you sit there for for even 5 minutes, just 5 minutes of doing that, your day will be much easier. The the amount of stress that you can handle during the day will go up. I like can promise you that. I've seen that in my life. If I don't meditate every morning, I feel like I can't tolerate as much stress and things kind of uh, bother me more. So for Kathy, I would suggest doing a, a simple, start off with just five minutes a day of, of breathing, just breathing, that's all it is, just focusing on the in-breath and the out-breath through your nose and try to work up to 10 minutes and then 15 minutes or 20 minutes and above. And um, I bet that your blood pressure would go down a little bit if you started to incorporate that into your daily regimen. Well said, I agree 100%. 
All right, well, let's take another uh, question here from our audience. This is from Ian. I have read that not much zinc is absorbed into the bloodstream from zinc tablets and even less into the cell. Any way of helping with this? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of zinc preparations, for example. Uh, it's a good question because um, there's certain, like, could zinc oxide, uh, for example, be less absorbed than zinc picolinate, for example, or, you know, or an ascorbate? And, in, and the answer is yes. In other words, any mineral, and uh, even, even magnesium is a classic example of this, uh, if you can use different Krebs cycle components or, you know, uh, different preparations may get better absorbed. So um, I, I agree with the question. And if you try one zinc preparation and it's not doing anything for you, just get a different, you know, preparation with it, with, with a different delivery system and see what happens. But zinc is very crucial, especially in men. And the, the link between prostate health, sexuality and the male, a lot of it depends on zinc. Uh, so um, zinc is one mineral that um, a lot of us males are not privy to, and uh, we, we really need more of it going forward, especially, you know, males in my age group as well. Yeah, and there are supplements out there, too, that have different forms of zinc in it. So you can get the oxide, the picolinate, um, and other ones as well. Right, the ascorbate. The ascorbate, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's take another uh, question from our audience here. This is from Gail Acosta. What about L-theanine for stress? Yeah, I, go, I, go like, ahead, I like L-theanine. I think yep. it's uh, it's a really safe uh, supplement to take. People can take it in the morning. They can take it in the evening for better stress. And uh, my understanding is that it really puts your 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 brain in your uh, into more of a, a calming brainwave state. So you, you're not all jazzed up and all stressed out, but it can really just calm down your brain. And I do find that that's helpful for people that are trying to manage stress uh, or even for sleep, for that matter. Yeah, um, I would echo that. And uh, if, if you do want to take L-theanine, there are preparations that also contain melatonin. And I love melatonin, especially in this day and age of COVID as well. Melatonin is a really powerful antioxidant. I mean, people don't realize this. In fact, in the sun, melatonin and CoQ10 are the first two antioxidants to, that, to be used up in the body very quickly, you know, in, con in combating the UV rays of sunlight. So um, I think melatonin will not only help you sleep better at night. Now, it's amazing. Some people can get a benefit from a milligram or half a milligram. Some people need 10 to 15 milligrams, uh, big doses at night. So, you know, for wherever you lie, you can start out a half a milligram to a milligram of melatonin, see if it helps. And if it doesn't help, just go a little bit higher. But uh, I think sleeping today uh, under all the stress we have is, is probably the best antioxidant we, we could possibly <laughs> have in our bodies because sleep really heals the body. And uh, especially, you know, productive REM sleep is really the best sleep to have. And let's, let's talk about sleep while we're on the subject here, Dad. I think, and, and melatonin as well, because what people do is they're on their computers late at night, they're on their oh, tablets, yeah. the they're on their thing. cell phones, yeah. they're texting. And, and when you're looking at that blue light, that's actually suppressing the body's endogenous right. production of melatonin. So let's, you know, rewind and even say, hey, get off your devices, just take a break socially distance from your devices, let's call it that, and uh, take a break. And I know, Dad, your son, Step, my brother, he uses candlelight in, in the evenings, and he doesn't really use any of these lights and, and oh. whatnot. And he finds that that really helps with his sleep. And I do think that more of us need to be more um, cognizant uh, of light and how it can affect us because the lights around us, whether they're compact fluorescent bulbs or the blue light coming from your screens, they can, they can uh, mess with your brain and they can mess with melatonin levels. And I think we need to be more aware of that. Yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned um, even a cell phone. Some children sleep with a cell phone underneath their pillow and they're getting that EMF and that can really disrupt sleep and it can cause a you know ADD ADHD. It can cause bizarre behavior. So if any parents are listening, if your children if your children are sleeping with a cell phone on under their pillow to avoid missing a call, um, call them on it because this is this is a, a dangerous situation that I think you know we don't want to get into undesirable circumstances here. But um, you know children are under a lot of stress as it is. But a cell phone underneath a pillow. 
I believe will create more, you know, physiological stress in, uh, to the body. And Dad, when we interviewed uh, the, the Perlmutters, um, David and Austin Perlmutter, we talked about how dopamine and that whole dopamine pathway with getting a text message from a friend or a notification, and that can be keeping kids up at night too, because you're right, they've got the cell phone underneath the pillow and they're waiting for that next text to come in, which ultimately is stimulating their dopamine system. And that's going to keep them up at night. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, you know, our brains have been hijacked by the social media stuff, right? By the phone being there and waiting for the next test message or the alert to come through. And so we need to break that cycle. And I think you said it so eloquently there, just get rid of your cell phone at night, exactly. turn it off, put an airplane turn it off. let it go. Focus on sleep. Exactly. <laughs> sleep heals. Sleep heals the body. It looks like we've got another question on melatonin here. This is from Lee Krieger. Is melatonin safe to take on an ongoing basis? You know, I think it is. I mean, um, I've gone to lectures uh, where melatonin has been discussed, even by the original scientists who have been using it for decades. And, and even high dose melatonin, like 15 milligrams uh, taken at night, that's a huge dose. Uh, but I don't see a downside to melatonin. Uh, if, I, if I do come across one, we'll be the first to tell you, but I have not seen a downside to low dose melatonin. Again, I don't take the 10 to 15 milligrams like some of my colleagues do, but um, you know, I do take low dose melatonin and I think it helps me. I'll say this. I, I think that there, there is a subset of the population. I, I can't really give a number, maybe 10%, maybe 5% that, that don't react well to melatonin, even in physiological doses. I've seen even, um, you know, one milligram or even less uh, cause sedation in people where they can't, they, they feel groggy in the morning, they feel hungover and uh, melatonin just isn't for them. But for the majority of the population, yes, melatonin can be helpful and it can be taken uh, long-term. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because like beta blockers, melatonin can cause vivid dreaming in some people as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the dreams, uh, you know, um, may not include, you know, only good content. So I, I, I've heard that as well. And exactly. again, melatonin and beta, beta blockers were the, were the two more, more common supplements and, and pharmaceuticals that people reported to me. Right. Well, let's see if we have another question here from the audience. By the way, guys, these are great questions. So continue posting these. These are, these are awesome. Uh, this is from Jeff. Hey there, Jeff. Uh, doc hey there, Dr. Sinatra. I've been having more trouble than usual sleeping. Mostly my mind is too active and anxious. I already take magnesium. Any recommendations for other natural ways to relax and sleep better? Well, if you really want to calm down the autonomic ner nervous system immediately, uh, if you, you know, when your head hits the pillow, this, this is so simple. You can breathe in to the count of four in one nostril. Hold it and then breathe into the breathe out to the count of eight in the alternate of nostril. So you're breathing into four, out to eight. Do that about four or five cycles, and that can really calm you down before sleep. And and I'll tell you, it's worked on a lot of people. I know as a cardiologist, sleep disorders was prevalent among my population, and I taught them that one exercise, and so many people came back and thanked me because. Uh, it does work because it discharges the autonomic nervous system immediately. And we call that alternative nostril breathing. Yeah, I'm happy you mentioned that, Dad, because people need to be doing, actually, they have to be doing something like that in, in this day and age, right? If, there's, if it's deep breathing, if it's the alternative nostril breathing, if it's meditation, if it's some form of qigong or tai chi. Or prayer, or, even a prayer. Or prayer, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We need something like that because we're all stressed and it's affecting our sleep like it is for Jeff. And Jeff, I would suggest even doing something throughout the day, you know, like set a, set a timer on your phone where noon hits and you do, a, you do a 10 second pause and you look around and say, okay, what's going on in my life right now? Let me, let me get centered back in my body. And you do little checks like that throughout the day and that can certainly uh, calm things down for your mind at night because it's, this is a cumulative thing. This isn't just occurring at night for you, but it's a, the daily stress is affecting you and unfortunately it's, it's coming on at night. There's even an, an app out there called Breathing Zone that I have a lot of my patients download and do. And what it does is it paces your breathing. So you can set it for five breaths per minute or six breaths per minute. Or if you're pretty experienced, you can even do four breaths per minute. And um, I'll do that one or two times throughout the day. I'll even drive to work listening to it. And it helps me just focus and concentrate on my, on my breathing, which can really help with putting you into more of a parasympathetic state and, and help calm down that brain activity of yours. 
Um, also, Jeff, I would suggest, uh, and I think uh, my dad and I may disagree on this, but I do like CBD for sleep. I find that it can be very uh, calming for people. Generally speaking, it's, it's very safe to use. Uh, there are some people that do feel sedated from it, as we talked about, as like melatonin. So some people, it's not for them. But I do find uh, CBD to be really good. You mentioned magnesium already uh, in your question. I absolutely love magnesium. There's many different forms out there that you can take. There's there's uh, sustained release ones. There's magnesium three and eight. There's even like citrate that people like to take uh, before they go to bed to help them sleep. And I would also suggest, uh, and I think you mentioned already, Dad, but the, the earthing grounding aspect. I think that's oh, a, so important. a knockout there. So yeah. great, yeah. great point there. All right, let's um, let's have another question here from our audience. This is from Clyde Newcomb. Awesome, you guys are health gurus. Heart, heart, heart. Thank you, Clyde. That's 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 awesome. Thank you so much for your comment. <laughs> All right, this is from Lydia Cordis. Dr. Sinatra, could nausea after exercise be related to the heart? I've exercised all my life, but now even with light exercise, I get nauseous. This is uh, uh, not usual, especially since you have been exercising before and you don't get nauseous. So this is what I would do. Um, could nausea be a cardiac symptom? Yes, it could be. So the, I... For now, I would hold exercise to a minimum. I would call your doctor and try to set up an exercise stress test and just work out on a treadmill. It's fun, believe me. I mean, I've had a, about a half a dozen of myself and I've done 40,000 of them in my career. And you know, if you see a heart specialist or an internist that does exercise stress testing, you get on a treadmill. And if you notice that with exercise that you get nauseous, and at the same time, your EKG is changing. Well, that could mean that the nausea is related to the heart that's struggling to get oxygen. So just keep that in mind. Even though it's only about a 10 or 15% chance of having a, you know, a cardiac-related problem, it's, it's still enough to get screened for. So I would definitely you know, call your doctor and just tell them that when you exercise, you get a little nauseous and just have an exercise test and then Whatever the results are, uh, you just go forward. If the, if the stress is positive, you know you you may need a CT uh, scan or a CT angiogram or even a coronary angiogram. Uh, you know it, it doesn't matter, but the most important thing is you get screened because uh, when it comes to the heart, you do not want to live in denial. Yeah, and I would add to that, Dad too. She may want to look into getting a, a a chem panel, just looking at electrolyte status. Uh, you know potassium and calcium levels. Oh yeah, all of that is good, yeah. And and also looking at thyroid function and uh, while you're at it, running a, a cortisol or even a four point cortisol curve if that's even available. But, and, and lastly, I'd look at electrolyte status too. I mean, sometimes people can be really deficient in electrolytes and then exercise can really wipe them out and wear them out. And if you have enough electrolytes in your system, that can be enough to mitigate that nausea sometimes. Okay. Well, you guys, these are great questions. So let's keep these things coming in here. Let's 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 field another one here from the audience. Uh, this is from Lynn Knopper. Hey, Lynn. My question is about stress in my digestion. As someone who already suffers from GI issues, the stress of today's environment has been making my GI even more angry at me. I do take ashwagandha, but what can I do to really help calm down my gut? Yeah, I, go ahead, Dad. I would tell Lynn to buy Dr. Murray's book, you know, Longevity, what was it? Longevity Matrix, right? The Longevity Drew? Matrix. Um, when I read his section on digestion, uh, I felt that that was the best section on digestion I have ever read from anybody in my lifetime. Uh, I thought he, did, he he's done an outstanding job. You know, he's just like you, Drew. He's a natural path. And um, I, I just feel that he brings an enormous amount to the table, uh, especially on digestive issues. And uh, uh, Lynn, that would be my tip of the day for you is to, you know, go to his book and uh, or even listen to the podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we asked uh, Michael questions about digestion because I thought it was awesome. Again, I review so many books, Drew. I read a book a week from other authors asking me for endorsements. And I only endorse maybe one out of three or four or five books. I mean, because there's so many books... I disagree with certain things, and uh, but you know this book was just just awesome. You know, I, I agreed with about ninety five percent of what it was written. It was yeah. great. 
No, I agree. Well, to, to add on to your, your answer there, Dad, uh, for Lynn, listen, we know that stress is probably having an effect on our microbiome as well. And uh, I don't think this has been really talked about too, Dad, but think about all the, the, the sanitizers that we're using, right? I mean, I, I, go to, I go to Costco, I go to Whole Foods, I go to Trader Joe's, and I, I take You're the absorbed. shopping cart, and it's already on my hands, right? And I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't ask for it to be put on there. And unfortunately, you know, our, our microbiome is linked. I mean, not just with our gut, but our, we have a skin microbiome as well. And I, I think that um, hand washing is really the best thing that we can do these days, especially washing your hands for a solid 20 seconds, right? Because that helps dissolve the viral coat of COVID. Um, and, and, and when you're in a pinch, having a sanitizer is ob obviously pretty helpful as well. But I think that um, unfortunately, there, it's everywhere now. I mean, now our schools are going to be cleaned and every single surface uh, in our house is going to be cleaned and every building and everything that you touch, doorknobs, et cetera, are being cleaned. And uh, unfortunately, we're not getting natural exposures that we should be. And I think the reason I'm even talking about all this is because everything is linked to our microbiome of our guts. And I do find that um, stress in general uh, can actually reduce the diversity of the microorganisms in your gut. So for Lynn, I'd also suggest getting on a good probiotic because uh, I think we're under trouble these days with the onslaught of uh, disinfectants and sanitizers and everything. And I don't know what that's doing to our, our gut microbiome, to be honest with you. I don't think we uh, know yet the implications of that. So I would get on a really good probiotic to help with your digestion as well. All right, let's see if we have another question here from our audience. This is from Kevin Smith. I have heard that some sort of medication, sorry, I have heard that some sort of meditation can help atrial fibrillation. Oh, yeah, absolutely true. In fact, uh, there's been studies on, and, on yoga, for example. When pe people do yoga and then meditate after a yoga session, uh, the reoccurrence of atrial fibrillation is exceedingly less. These are in people who had recurrent atrial fibrillation. So, yeah, meditation, remember, calms the mind. And whenever you calm the mind, you're attenuating the autonomic nervous system, which has a big impact on atrial fibrillation. The other thing about atrial fibrillation is we're seeing more of it today because of the electromagnetics in the environment. I'm afraid 5G may make it even worse. So be aware that if you are getting more symptoms of, a of AF or atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, beware of cordless phone, computers, cellular phone, you know, 5G transmitters, et cetera, et cetera, because the heart is the most vulnerable organ as well as parts of the brain to electromagnetic stress. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see if we have another question here. This is from Mary Jane. Hello, any suggestions for someone trying to heal and strengthen the lungs after viral pneumonia? That's a, that's a, Good point. And I'll tell you one thing about COVID. Um, even though you can get through the viral pneumonia, uh, a lot of these patients, because uh, the antibodies don't seem to last long, and a lot of these patients can get a relapse of, of the same symptoms going forward. Um, so it's just important to realize that if you do, you know, have a COVID-like syndrome or a pneumonia, that, you know, instead of getting better in two or three weeks, you may improve in two or three weeks, but it may take months, I mean months, to really get back to, to par. And uh, uh, even when I was a cardiologist in the ICU and CCU, I'm talking about the decades, whenever we saw these viral pneumonias, we always saw cardiac related problems even later on. So uh, even though the, the, ammonia, the, the pneumonia can attack the, the, the lung tissue, uh, it can have a propensity for cardiac, we call that cardiac myocytes. And even the, uh, the experience in Wuhan, China, there's about 20% of people who had the, the viral illness, they developed cardiac-related disorders, and we call that myocarditis. Mm -hmm. And I think that all those things that we mentioned earlier for general immune support uh, would, would be helpful for uh, many different viral conditions um, in the lungs. I would add on board NAC. Right, you oh. and I are big, big fan of NAC. Absolutely, NAC. Remember, when you take N-acetylcysteine, uh, it gets reduced to a, a glutathione derivative. And when you have NAC with glutathione in the body with selenium and vitamin C, it forms glutathione peroxidase. And that's the most important endogenous antioxidant you can possibly take in your body. The other thing is that quercetin, you know, mm -hmm. and quercetin, 
you and I did a lung formula together with quercetin and NAC. And quercetin has been shown in the literature to have a great impact on viral pneumonias. Uh, and I'll tell you, I've always loved that Zeppelin elderly study. I've mentioned it before in podcasts, but the more Dutchmen who took in the more quercetin in their body over decades lived the longest. So quercetin has a factor in, in longevity. And in that, in that Zeppelin elderly study, they measured one thing, how long you lived. They didn't care whether you died of cancer, heart disease, or a stroke. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. They just were looking at years of life and the higher blood levels of quercetin, the longer you lived. So you can take that one to the bank as well. <laughs> We're both big quercetin fans, that's for exactly. sure. Exactly. We love quercetin and NAC and acetylcysteine. They're, they're great to take, you know. Alpha lipoic acid is another one, Drew. I'm really liking uh, ALA. It's great um, antioxidant. Oh, yeah, because I, I, mm -hmm. I think even in this um, day and age, um, especially more and more people, I don't know whether it's due, due to all the diabetes we're seeing, but we're seeing so much peripheral neuropathy yeah. where people are getting you know nerve pain. And this is where alpha lipoic acid really helps. I mean, I think it really helps uh, with people, you know, whether you're having tri trigeminal neuralgia-like symptoms or burning pain in your in your feet that diabetics get. I think ALA is a great supplement for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we have here for more questions. This is from Janice King. I had gallbladder surgery Monday, June 27th. Now I'm having heart palpitations. What is good for this? Spoke with my doc. She said it could be from pain medication. You know, it, it could be. June 27th, though, you're, 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 you're more than six weeks. You're about six weeks. I mean, you, you should be healed. But, like, if you're still having heart palpitations, make sure you get some electrolytes drawn and some renal function drawn just to make sure it's not a meta metabolic situation. Remember, when a gallbladder is taken out, you know, the body has to adjust, you know, to, you know, to actually – the. the you, you won't store the amount of bile that you normally have. So it may have an impact. Um, inflammation could, you know, also be a factor. So, you know, just make sure that if it doesn't go away, you do get it checked, you know, with a, even a routine electrocardiogram or a, or a 24 hour monitor, or even a, you know, a King of Hearts monitor that goes on for a week. Any of these things are good to, just to make sure you don't have any, you know, significant arrhythmia that you need to be concerned about. And I would add on to that. I mean, you mentioned digestive enzymes in the beginning being really good for digestion. And for this uh, woman, I would suggest um, some sort of digestive enzyme that has lipase in it or even exactly. like an ox bile to help emulsify the fats that you're going to be getting from your diet. Because I think over the years, I've learned that if there's one organ that uh, can be removed that can really alleviate lots of symptoms for people, it is the gallbladder. However, you need to support the body's natural function uh, and, and with bile, it helps emulsify fats. And so you need, you need support with that using enzymes and like a lipase or an ox bile to help facilitate that. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because um, there is a subset of patients that I've seen who had palpitations due to GI issues alone, had nothing to do with their heart. So, you know, again, this could be an adjustment of the surgery and the bile relationships as well. Exactly. Well, let's, let's take about two, three more questions here, Dad. Let's see what we have here. This is from Isaiah Jim. What can you recommend for extreme fatigue, also for stronger immune? Well, I'd say, Isaiah, you know, you're probably going to have to get worked up and make sure your, your, your thyroid's functioning well, make sure you're not anemic, uh, make sure there's other, uh, no major causes that are causing that extreme fatigue. Um, I would say, yeah, figure out what's going on there. Maybe you need to look into something like a mold illness or even a Lyme disease because, you know, there's, there's certain things out there that can really, really devastate and bring down people's energy. And you got to figure out the underlying cause because if you just throw certain vitamins and minerals and herbs and things at it, it, it may not improve unless you really figure out the underlying cause. Um, I don't know if you want to add on to that, Dad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to see if there is a cause. I mean, again, it, it could be, you know, prolonged, severe emotional stress that just attacks the body and, and just wears us down. I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, I'm a big CoQ10 proponent. I mean, uh, whenever I hear fatigue, uh, the most energizing nutrient you can possibly take that drives ATP or the energy of life in a preferential direction is coenzyme Q10. So, 
I would definitely take CoQ10, you know, without a doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. Magnesium is another one gets, that gets worn down under, under emotional stress. So magnesium and CoQ10 are, are two supplements and anyone uh, with fatigue. Uh, but again, um, uh, you, you know, we, we want to turn over a few cards and make sure that, you know, the fatigue doesn't have an organic cause as opposed to a, a, a theoretical emotional or a stressful situation. Yeah. Or, or even the heart. And, but like you were talking about here, dad, it sounds like, um, with CoQ10 and magnesium, we're addressing it more from mitochondrial function and, oh yeah. And yeah. if the mitochondria are severely depleted and worn down, that can, that can surely cause extreme fatigue in people as well. Exactly. All right. Let's see what else we have here. This is from, uh, Peter Hogue. I get headaches and it seems my headaches cause me more negative thoughts and anxiety. Can headaches or other physical syndromes cause persistent anxiety and stress? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll jump in, Dad. I think, you know, when we're under lots of stress like we are now, we tend to get really tense in our shoulders and our neck. We, you know, we're on the computer all the time like this. And so our posture is off and that can create a lot of tension in the neck and shoulders and create headaches for people. And so we need to really work on proper ergonomics, making sure that you're sitting at your computer properly or the worst that I found dad. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this personally is when you're texting, it's like the angle at which you, you lower your head down to text really can create a lot of uh, neck tension for people. So I've actually been having to guide and coach people on properly texting, which I never thought I'd have to do in my career, but <laughs> oh, uh, you know, there's certain things that we do on a daily basis that we may not be aware of that is creating that tension along the neck and shoulders, which can create uh, the headaches. And uh, you're absolutely right uh, with your question that it can create anxiety and depression because when you're under chronic pain like that, I mean, your world can be miserable. It's like you just feel like you're under this tension all the time. And, and surely that's going to bring down your mood and create some depression or anxiety. So I think for you, figuring out really what is creating your headache would probably be the place to start. And, uh, and really working on a lot of these stress reduction practices that my father and I talked about today. And I would just add just a couple of things. Certainly magnesium and CoQ10. Uh, I've seen a lot, a lot of people who had uh, temporal type of uh, headaches and migraine type headaches improve significantly, uh, amazingly on CoQ10 and magnesium. The other thing is uh, I've seen people with a lot of headache who had an inability to cry. Uh, mm. Now I'm talking energetically as a bioenergetic therapist, but people who hold back sadness and tears get m way more headaches than people who don't. So if you can give yourself permission to cry and allow the energy to go out instead of holding the energy in, uh, that in itself uh, can be life-saving for you and, and uh, uh, make your life a lot easier if uh, you can sob deeply and get rid of that internal tension that, that and some people can cause severe headache. Dad, I'm so glad that you got your psychotherapy training because that's just it's amazing, fantastic. isn't it? Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I wish more doctors were like you. Okay, let's do one last question here. And this is from Anisha Thomas. What supplements can help protect the heart during this awful time? Oh my gosh, there's so many things. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, garlic and onions, these are two foods that are at the top of my list. Avocado would be another top food. Broccoli with sulforaphane, another top food. Lycopene and tomatoes. Certainly supplements. I mean, all in on omega 3, uh, CoQ10. I mean, I'm a big proponent of squid oil. I love it because it has more DHA in it. And DHA is really good for the heart as well as the retina of the eye and the brain. Um, certainly ashwagandha as an adaptogen. We talked about that one before for, you know, stress going forward. I mean, there's, there's so many things uh, that you can possibly take. It's just, um, you know, I take a ton of supplements a day. Uh, I don't bat an eye on it. And uh, uh, I, I truly believe uh, it helps me. And don't forget the natural stuff like grounding and the avoidance of sugars as well. And dad, this uh, now I'll put on the psychotherapy hat and, and yeah. say that if there's any grief or anger or sadness or fear that you need to let go of in your life, that let yourself cry, let yourself yeah. laugh hysterically. Um, try to smile more, even under the mask when you're in the grocery store and no one can see your face, just smile at people because that really is, is a way to, to connect with other people and express yourself. Because I feel like even these days with, with us wearing masks all the time, you're not seeing anyone's expression on your face. And I feel like we need to con like uh, connect more as human beings. Um, so if there is some sort of an underlying emotion for you that you do need to get out, I would say express it because it's going to be really good for your heart. And I'd only add on one, uh, one herbal to what my father suggested, and that would be crutagus 
or hawthorn berry, which has traditionally been used as like a tonifier for the heart and cardiovascular system. And um, I find that it's just another thing to have on board to support heart function. Good. Well said. Well, everyone, this was just so great. Uh, Dad, I'm so happy that you and I got to do this again after a hiatus of 1.5 years here. So. Oh, it's been that long. I thought it was just a year. Okay. Yeah, maybe it was. I, maybe, I, I wasn't sure if it was a year, year and a half, but um, wow, this was just great. We should do this again. I love, I love answering questions that our, our listeners have. Um, so thanks for joining us, everyone, and uh, let's do this again soon. All right. I agree. Be All well, right. everyone. Bye now. Bye.